Hello again and welcome back to another edition of Camp Chapters. This time we're tackling chapters 12 through 17. I am Nick Ranke and this is The Secret Life of Amanda K. Woods. Chapter 12, The Secret. Amanda was alone. She had forgotten she was Amanda K. Woods and was just plain Amanda. It was a bright moonlit night all the stores were closed in Rome, and there was no one on Main Street except one person moving quickly toward Amanda, with an echoing tap, tap, tap of high-heeled shoes. At first, Amanda couldn't see clearly who it was, and then she was sure it was her school principal, Miss Deverest. But something was odd about the shape of her face, and the furriness of her dress, and the way her pointy ears stuck up high on her head. Amanda, Miss Deverus growled, it's a full moon at midnight, and poor little girl, you're alone. She grabbed Amanda's shoulders between her hairy paws. Miss Deverus, Amanda said, excuse me, but you're a werewolf. Miss Deverus smiled with the biggest smile Amanda had ever seen, and in the moonlight, her long fangs gleamed. That's right, Miss Deverus said, and that's why I know many things most people don't know. I know why not one single person likes you, Amanda. It's a secret. Shall I tell you? No, Amanda shouted. Tears welled in Miss Deverest's brown eyes and trickled down her massive furry jaws. She looked lonely, but not evil. Are you real? Amanda asked. Miss Deverest didn't answer that. The tears just kept running down her face. Shall I tell you the secret? She repeated. Amanda tried not to be afraid. All right, she said, tell me. She never found out the secret though, because right then she rolled hard in something warm and heavy that turned out to be Margaret. She woke up and was angry, but that didn't matter because there, were, there was no werewolf and Amanda wasn't on Main Street anymore. Moving on to chapter 13, the wise one. Margaret wrote an advice column for the Rome High School paper. A drawing of an owl wearing glasses was the logo for her column, and she signed it the wise one. As the wise one, Margaret always sounded much nicer and wiser than her normal self. Margaret was leaning on pillows, reading her biology book, and marking certain lines with a pencil. Amanda, next to her, was reading the first wise one column of the year. For luck, she stretched her Lyle Leverage hand behind her till for a second. It just touched her four-leaf clover. This is a good column, Margaret, Amanda said. Thanks, Margaret said. She didn't look up. I know somebody with a problem that would be a good that would be good for your column, Amanda said. Yeah, who? Margaret said. She didn't sound grateful. There's a new girl at school, Amanda explained, and she doesn't have any friends because people think she is stuck up because of this other place she is from, and people don't trust her because she hasn't been around. Margaret yawned. A problem from Lincoln School won't do for the Rome High paper, she said. Amanda got the sinking feeling that she would soon lose Margaret's attention. This girl is so troubled she is dreaming continually about werewolves. Amanda said. Really? Margaret sounded interested. Well, anyway, what should she do? Because I could tell her what you say. You are so good. You are probably the only person in town who could help her. The Lone Ranger would not have been a flatterer, but Amanda felt she had no choice. Margaret sat up. She put her book down. This girl needs to understand one simple thing, she said. If she wants other people to be interested in her, she has to show interest in them. Also, she needs to understand human evolution. Human evolution, Amanda said. It's like this, Margaret said. From three million years back, from the beginning of mankind, all people have lived in groups. Thousands and thousands of years later, they developed their brains. Groups of people are like herds of horses or cows. They sniff the wind, they are alert for danger, they keep out strangers, they don't know why, they just do. And they all think as one. If one of them didn't, he or she would turn into a stranger. If this girl had been 
snot had just been snotty to one person, she could go to that person and apologize. But you say you say she was snotty to the entire group. I didn't say she was snotty. Amanda protested. It sounds to me like she was snotty. Margaret said. If so, nothing she can say will ever make them trust her, because groups do not think in words, and they do not decide things by listening to words. They decide by something else. This girl has to act like a cow or a horse or a fish. She has to pretend she has been at your school forever. She must stand around with all the girls who stand around and listen to the conversation but not say one word. She should just look interested and friendly. That is very important. And look like she knows about everything that is going on. She should do this for weeks, months maybe. Finally, one day, someone in the group will make a mistake and talk to her. Why would anybody make a mistake? Probably because her smell has changed. She will have been around them a long time, long enough to smell like the group. Do the fifth grade girls have a smell? Amanda didn't smell any smell on them at all. The boys didn't have any smell either. The fifth grade does not smell, Amanda said. Everybody smells, Margaret said. The smell is subliminal. You smell it even though you don't know you're smelling it, like the hidden pictures in advertisements. You don't know you're seeing them, but they affect you anyway. It was astonishing the things Margaret knew. Amanda tried to remember all this information. Then what? After she smells okay and somebody talks to her, then what? Then she can answer. What should she say? She should just respond to what is said. The important thing isn't what she says back. It's the way she acts. This is crucial. She shouldn't act surprised or startled or anything like that. Absolutely the worst thing she could do would be to act thrilled. She has to answer just as if the other girls have been talking to her for years and years, and it is normal. But the answer should be short. After that, she can say a few things, but no more than one sentence once or twice a week. She shouldn't say anything about where she's from. That will just make them remember that she is stuck up. She should ask the other girls about themselves. As Dale Carnegie says, people like you when you are interested in their interests. But what she asks shouldn't be too personal. For example, she could ask them if they like Pat Boone. Pat Boone was a singer on TV. Amanda didn't like Pat Boone. When he sang, he smiled all the time, even in the serious parts. I don't like Pat Boone, Amanda said. He looks like his lips are melting and running off his face. What does it matter what you like? It doesn't even matter what she likes. If she doesn't like Pat Boone, she should never say it. That will just make people think she is stuck up. She should say, do you like Pat Boone? And then just listen to what other people say. Amanda frowned. She couldn't help it. What if everybody really hated Pat Boone, but they all said they liked him just to fit in and fit what they thought everybody else thought? Everybody would be cowards, tricking everybody else and themselves too, and the group would be nothing but fake. Or, Margaret went on, if she doesn't want to talk about Pat Boone, she can ask somebody a question. People always like to talk about themselves. That's what Dale Carnegie says. Then, in about a month, she can invite the person who is the friendliest to do something with her. Like what? Whatever kids in, do in grade school, I don't remember, go to a movie, skate, something like that. Margaret opened her biology book, then closed it. Once she had started being the wise one, it was hard to quit. Where is this girl from? Out west. Out west, the wise one mocked. Don't you even keep track of states? Montana, I think, Amanda said. What's this girl's name, the wise one asked. Elizabeth. Elizabeth? Aha, said the wise one triumphantly. A name like Elizabeth, that could be part of the problem. She could, when they start talking to you, say she wants to be called Beth or Liz. That might help. She opened her biology book again. Thank you, Margaret. I'll give her your advice, Amanda said. Amanda was in Skipper's pasture. Instead of forking hay to Skipper, she carried a small bunch of it left to him in her hands. When she got close to him, she half shrugged, half bowed, and laid the hay at his feet. Just call me Mandy, he said. she said. She widened her eyes and lifted the corners of her mouth so it would show no trace of moping. 
Then she went back for another bunch. Skipper was still eating when she threw this one at his feet. He pricked his ears the way he did when he didn't know what she was up to. You kids can call me Mandy, Amanda said. She smiled like Pat Boone. Skipper snorted and tossed his head. Amanda brought a third bunch of hay. Skipper didn't want it. Amanda puzzled him. He watched her with concerned eyes. Hey, why don't you guys call me Mandy? I wish you guys would call me Mandy, Amanda said. Skipper ambled away. Skipper, come back, Amanda said. Amanda actually hated the name Mandy. Skipper could tell. Even for belonging, there were some things a person did not do. Chapter 14, The Group. Amanda always found a place to stand that was so, as far as possible from Mary Jane Stoltenberg. Even so, it was very difficult for Amanda to stand around with the fifth grade girls at recess. They pretended not to see her. She wanted to say something, anything, so that they would admit she was there. Keeping silent was the hardest thing she had ever done. And all the time, she kept wanting to walk away or run. To keep from running away, she thought of Lyle Leverage, who wasn't scared of anything. She thought of how she had his hand and he had hers. She thought how she was really Amanda K. Woods, a person with a sword in the middle of her name. She thought how she had a four-leaf clover and possibly a letter coming to her soon from a foreign country, and how deep down she was smart. Miss Harmon had said so. Amanda was not the person the fifth grade girls were seeing. Inside herself, she was another, better person. For 15 days, Amanda stood with the fifth grade girls at recess and nobody said one word to her. It was a painful time, just as if she weren't there. The girls talked about school and their families and watched the fifth grade boys. The fifth grade boys were acting different from the way they used to, so they were worth watching. One day, David Johnson, who was the Lutheran minister's son, and very smart and serious, chased Bob Larson with a dead mouse that he was holding by the tail. Both boys practically ran into the girls, who were disgusted. None of them could believe David could do anything so childish. The fifth grade girls all agreed that the fifth grade boys had deteriorated and were, and were much, much worse and re more revolting than they had ever been. Another day, Pamela Collins told everybody that she was starting to hate the name Pamela and would everyone call her Pam. One afternoon, Mary Jane Stoltenberg actually told a joke. She asked, do you know why Lincoln School teachers don't smile? Nobody knew. Because if they want to give a class a smile, first they have to get it from the supply room with a form signed by Miss Deverest, and she usually won't sign. So the old smiles get all musty in there. Do you know why Miss Harmon can smile anytime? Pam Collins said. Nobody knew. Because she was afraid there'd be a smile shortage in Rome, so she brought a big suitcase with her from California. She keeps it under her bed, and inside it she keeps a million smiles. One morning, Monica Rogowski told about how to get free chocolate. Her cousin in Manitowoc, had done it. What you did was buy a chocolate bar at the grocery store, eat it, and save the wrapper. Then you wrote the company that made it. You said that you had bought a chocolate bar, but that when you opened it, instead of being all brown, it had white spots. You enclosed the wrapper from your chocolate bar and put your full return address on the envelope. In a few weeks, Monica said, the candy company would send you a complete box of 36 chocolate bars with apologies for the white one. They would explain that the chocolate changes color when it gets old or a store is too hot, but that it doesn't go bad, and they would ask for the name of the store that had sold you the white spotted chocolate bar, because that store should have taken the white spotted chocolate bar off their shelves when it had passed a certain date, and they wanted to remind the store about that. A person couldn't do that here, Sherry Anderson said. Everybody knew a person couldn't. There were only two groceries in Rome, and their owners knew most everybody's parents. If you made a false complaint about a store, your parents would find out and you would get punished. That's something a person shouldn't do anyway, Pine Collins said. If the chocolate bar didn't turn white, it would really be stealing. 
She turned to Monica. I don't mean your cousin is a thief. I know it's just a game, but it's not honest. A stillness went through the group. Amanda could feel it. She respected Pam Collins for telling the truth. It was not easy to do in a group. It was Pam Collins who was the first person in the group who spoke to Amanda. She did it just as if she had been speaking to Amanda all her life. She was standing next to Amanda during recess and said, I wish I had a horse. I still remember what you wrote about yours. I liked what you wrote about singing too, Amanda said, and then following the, old one, the wise one's advice, she did not say a word in the group for three more days. When she did open her mouth again, everybody in the group turned to look at her, but she kept going very calmly. She said to Pam Collins, what's it like to have twin brothers? Yours are so cute. She expected Pam Collins to talk about them the way Margaret talked about her, to say they were pests. But Pam Collins agreed her brothers were cute. In fact, she said she adored them. One day, Amanda decided to invite Pam Collins to do something. She saw her alone, leaving school. Would you like to go to my dad's hotel and have some ice cream? Well, I suppose not, was the way Amanda put it, squeezing the fingers of her Lyle Leverage hand. Would you repeat that, Pam Collins said. Amanda repeated it, except for the last part. Pam Collins said, sure. Chapter 15, Party in Room 70. Pam Collins had curly black hair and blue eyes, and so did her two little first grade brothers, Max and Marky. Amanda thought all three of them were the most beautiful people she had ever seen, and that having twin brothers was the most special thing in the world. Pam was one of the best students in fifth grade. She was definitely the best singer. Whenever the school put on a play, Pam got solo singing roles. Amanda admired this, Nobody in her family could sing at all. When they got to the Rome Hotel, Amanda first took Pam into her dad's office and introduced her. Then she do introduced Pam to Charlie, the cook for the Loggers Inn. She thought the ice cream servings might be better that way. Wow, said Pam Collins when she saw the Loggers Inn. She went around the room looking at all the logging tools and photos. Then Amanda showed her the player piano bar in the bar and they played old songs, their feet pushing the pedals that moved the piano roll. After that, they sat down in the Loggers Inn, and Charlie sent out maple nut ice cream with double helpings of chocolate sauce on top. My family has always wanted to come in here, Pam said. We just never did. I come here every day, Amanda said. Usually I do my homework here. That's nice, Pam said. I do mine at home on the kitchen table but it's hard to concentrate sometimes with Max and Marky around. You could do it here with me, Amanda said. She hesitated, if you ever wanted to. And Pam said, if her mother, mother let her, she would. After that, Amanda and Pam walked together down to the hotel almost every day and studied. One day they got a surprise because when they arrived, Miss Harmon was already there talking to Amanda's father and telling him how wonderful it was that they were keeping, that he was keeping history alive through the Rome Hotel. Amanda hoped they hadn't been also been talking about her. That night on the way home, Amanda's dad asked her how her arithmetic was. So, so, Amanda said. I'll make a bargain with you, he said. What kind of bargain, Amanda asked. If you can get straight 100s on your arithmetic, so long as the hotel isn't full, you and your friend can have a room of your own to study in. Amanda thought about it. She was excited, but she tried not to show it. I'll see if Pam is interested, she said. There wasn't any point in making such a sacrifice for arithmetic if there was no reason. When Amanda told Pam the next day, she said, let's go look at the room. That afternoon, Amanda's dad took them up to it and opened the door and they knew they wanted it. It was room 17, the tower room with a view of most of Rome and the Red Cedar River. It was round with a bay window and had a desk that was curved on one side and fitted in under the window. When Amanda's desk brought in an extra desk chair, 
When, his ma when Amanda's dad brought in an extra desk chair, they could see that the desk was big enough for both of them to use. The room had also had a bed and two wicker rocking chairs with soft cushions. I'll give you two free, day free trial days, Amanda's dad said, smiling. After that, to keep on staying, Amanda would have to show him every single arithmetic paper. That was the hard part. What do you get on your arithmetic, Amanda asked Pam after her dad had left. Straight hundreds almost, Pam said. How do you do it? I check every single problem twice. I hope there was an easier way, Amanda said. In terms of homework, Amanda was a scrambler. She probably had always done homework the fastest of anybody in her class. Grab it and go was her method. Afterward, never bring the corrected homework back home, where it might attract unfavorable attention. Pam Collins was very different. She was a person gathered together in her own ways. She kept her books beside her in the exact order in which she intended to do her homework. And then, at a regular careful pace, she did it all until she finished it. You could read every word or number Pam Collins wrote without having to puzzle it out. Also, if Pam Collins wrote that 2018 divided by 37 was 54.54, you could be sure that it was the true answer. To keep room 17, Amanda also had to get the true answers. Pam would not share hers. The fifth grade was doing long division with decimals and getting everything right took time. Amanda decided that, she, that since she had to do it right, she might as well also make it neat. When she finished it all, she double checked it. There were four problems with mistakes and Amanda fixed them. One part of her, even with Pam working beside her, thought the whole thing was very boring. Another part of her considered the idea that a wrong answer in arithmetic was kind of a lie. Every time you got a wrong answer and let it stay, you were letting yourself be a person who didn't care about the truth. With her neat numbers and new correct double-checked arithmetic, her paper actually looked pretty. Amanda was proud of it. At the top, if she wrote the date and not just her usual Amanda Woods, but Amanda K. Woods. Amanda Woods was the kind of person who would get her arithmetic more or less right at least half the time. Amanda K. Woods was like Pam Collins, the kind of person who didn't tell a lie. What she said, even on a homework paper, you could count on it to be true. Chapter 16, A Letter for Miss Woods. The sky blue envelope was so fine and smooth that Amanda thought it might dissolve in her hand. The handwriting on it flowed like blue silk thread. Elegantly and loosely knotted, it formed Amanda's real name exactly the way it was supposed to be written. Even her, in her own fanciest script, Amanda had never seen Amanda K. Woods look so good. With great care, using her mother's silver paper knife and her Lyle leverage hand, she cut the envelope. Dear Miss Woods, I am a French student age of 17. I study English in school. My parents say I must have an American pen pal to improve my English. My father and mother are both professors of mathematics in Lyon. It may be that they will teach at the University of California in Berkeley, California some year. They say I must be ready with English if we go there. Really, I do not much like English. I prefer soccer, or do you say football? I also enjoy philosophy and to ski in the Alps and to go to the cinema with my friends. What are your hobbies, Miss Woods? Please write me, I will write back. If I do not write letters in English, my father will put himself in anger and kill me. Sincerely, Antoine Bonnier. P.S. I enclose my photo. My name, in case you wouldn't know, is pronounced Antoine Bonnier. Amanda studied Antoine Bonnier's photo. He had a nice smile, a slightly narrow face, wavy hair combed straight back, and eyes that looked as if they were trying to see deep into things. Except for the eyes, 
he could have been a friend of Margaret's. Amanda loved the way he looked, and his handwriting, which was truly like the handwriting of a prince or someone like that. Anyway, not like the handwriting of someone from Rome, Wisconsin. Amanda decided to write him at once, after gathering herself together the way Pam would have done. She tried to remember all she knew about France. The information wavered before her mind's eye, like a landscape seen distorted. And, sh <gasps> and shimmering with distant heat. France, at some time, around 200 years back, France had helped the United States to fight the revolution for freedom from England. At one time, Amanda didn't know exactly when, France had a queen. Her name was Marie Antoinette. Her husband's name was King Somebody, with Roman numerals after it. The two of them lived very well, while the poor people of their country went hungry. Someone told the queen the people had no bread, but she only laughed and said, let them eat their cake. The poor people and evil, even the middle class people got very angry and invented an instrument called the guillotine. This was like a paper cutter, but much, much bigger. They used it to cut off the king and queen's heads. That began the French Revolution, when the French got rid of kings and queens entirely, as well as a whole bunch of other people. The French invented French bread, but they didn't invent French fries or French vanilla ice cream. Those Amanda's mother had told her were invented in Chicago. No matter what Antoine said about his father killing him, Amanda was afraid he wouldn't write back to her unless he thought she was 17. She had to write a letter that sounded adult. Luckily, it was a Saturday and Margaret was over at a friend's house. That gave Amanda a chance to use Margaret's desk. She addressed an envelope with her very best Amanda K. Woods. On the return address corner, she pushed Margaret's stuff to the side of Margaret's desk so she could type the letter on Margaret's typewriter. Dear Antoine, I am glad to hear from you. You may call me Amanda, although please always use Amanda K. Woods on the envelope. My family is my father. He runs, owns a hotel in Rome, Wisconsin. My mother and my sister Margaret, who is sometimes a pain in the neck, but I think she will grow up someday. In school, the subjects I like are English, social studies, and sometimes science. I am sometimes an A student. I like to swim, ski, snowshoe, go to the movies, and ride horseback. My horse's name is Skipper. I do not know very much about France. However, I thank you for helping with our revolution. I am sorry about yours. I hope you didn't lose anyone in your family. The queen was wrong. Cake is only good from time to time. Someday I would like to have a philosophy of life, but it is very hard to get one around here. Do please write back. I will gladly help you with your English. I am an expert at it and have spoken it all my life. Sincerely, Amanda K. Woods. Amanda wanted to send a photo of herself, but she didn't have a single good one. The best one she could find in a jumbled box of snapshots in the living room was of her and her dad in their boat, just looking at the photo. She could remember the wind in her face and the boat going at top speed, almost skipping over the waves. It was too bad that the photo was blurred and that even though her hair covered part of her face, she didn't look 17. It wasn't fair. It wasn't fair because Margaret had a new, very, very good photo of herself in a hundred small size prints for all her best friends sitting right on the corner of the desk. Amanda picked up one of them. It wasn't just a regular snapshot. It was Margaret's senior portrait and she had posed two hours at Schilling's studio to get it. Amanda had always thought that Margaret was ordinary looking, sort of pretty when she took out her curlers and cleaned off her suntan lotion. In her senior portrait, though, she was beautiful. She looked out levelly, straight ahead, not with her head dipped down or to the side in a teasing look. 
the way some other senior girls were photographed. She was wearing a simple sleeveless black velvet dress with a delicate gauze net panel in front of her. Her hair was sleek in a perfect page boy that framed her face. Her lips curved upward, not smiling really, but warm and confident. She looked like the person you would want for your best friend. She looked like a person who was saying inside, I am beautiful and I am going to be a doctor. Could it be that you could never really see your own family, the people closest to you, until you saw someone else's picture of them? In the photo, Margaret was a stranger, stronger than Wonder Woman, truly the wise one, more real and more beautiful than a movie star. Anybody would write to the girl in that photo. Quickly, Amanda enclosed one in her letter to Antoine. 17. Secrets of Room 17. The days got shorter, the homework got longer. When the girls finished, they would look out the bay window at Main Street to the city park with its carpet of fallen leaves and its pretty blue and white bandstand. And beyond to the fast flowing, not yet frozen, Red Cedar River. Sometimes when they finished early, they would pick up the phone in room 17 and call down for ice cream from room service. Lots of times it was Charlie the cook who brought it up to them on a silver tray in tall glasses with extra long spoons and asked them how their work was going. After he left, they would tell each other things. Amanda told Pam how much she liked fishing with her dad. Pam said wistfully, I wish my dad and I spent time together. Her dad was a truck driver and he had to be away from home a lot, sometimes for two weeks straight. She wished, her, she wished her dad didn't drive trucks. I miss him a lot, she said. Sometimes I'm afraid that he'll get in an accident on the highway. Once I even dreamed of it. Just because you dream of something, that doesn't mean it will come true, Amanda said. She knew if dreams came true, Miss Deverest would probably have turned her into a werewolf. I know dreams usually don't happen, Pam said. I just wish I saw him all the time, and we were really close, like you and your dad. Amanda felt funny. She felt all of a sudden that she wasn't quite telling the truth about herself and her dad. I see my dad, Amanda said. I see him every day, but we aren't that close. I can't talk to him. I mean, we talk about fishing, or he shows me how to swim better, but I can't talk about anything personal with him. Why, Pam said. I don't know, Amanda said. My, bad, my dad is a person who doesn't want to talk. I don't know why. And he seems so friendly, Pam said. You should make him talk to you. Maybe you have to teach him to do it. Me teach my dad? If he can teach you things, why can't you teach him, Pam asked. Parents teach kids, Amanda said. Kids don't teach parents. But they can, Pam insisted. If I try to change my dad, it might make him angry, Amanda said. Maybe, Pam said, but then, it, again, it might make him glad. That was chapter 17. Tune in next time for chapters 18 through 23. Thank you for following along, and stay safe, everybody.